Was? Okay. Okay, good. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for their invitation. I'm really sorry, my Greek is very weak. I am unable to speak in Greek. And uh, really thank you to the team of interpreters, because without them I would be totally excluded. And uh, some people also need to understand me. So, I will try to be uh, as slow as possible to help you. But please make signs, both of you, or tell them in the headphone if I am too quick. And I will try to slow down. That. Uh, uh, they, she can catch up with what I, I want to say. Uh, thanks to Panos and uh, Christina for their introduction. They facilitate a lot my life because I can go to the next step. So I don't have to explain again what is degrowth. I don't have to explain again what is unconditional basic income. And I will uh, make a presentation in uh, three parts. So degrowth and basic income will be my first part. So a critical uh, approach of basic income from a degrowth point of view based on what Panos and Christina said. Uh, second point will be uh, uh, about uh, unconditional autonomy allowance because uh, from basic income we want to be the approach of uh, unconditional autonomy allowance which would be like uh, a degrowth basic income. And third part will be more about how do we start from this model of society toward a degrowth model of society in implementing step by step unconditional autonomy allowance and using as well in one of the steps unconditional basic income. So first, uh, a degrowth approach of unconditional basic income. So for, for us, when we started to think already more than 10 years ago about a political agenda or what kind of uh, social economic proposals uh, degrowth would offer, it was obvious that unconditional basic income is something which makes sense from a degrowth point of view. Because in degrowth, we have a very radical critiques to uh, uh, the domination of work culture or work uh, values in our model of society. Also, unconditional basic income, it's a way to disconnect our meaningful activities and economicism. It's what uh, uh, Pano spoke a lot about in his introduction. So for us, unconditional basic income could be a very interesting dynamic to uh, re-embed economy, as uh, uh, Karl Polanyi spoke about. So to put back economy in its right place and to make us be free to refuse type of bullshit job or toxic activities that we have to accept because we need money to survive. It's like uh, the new economic foundation in UK which may, who made a um, study showing that very often the more money you get, the more toxic is your is your job in this model of society. And the less money you, you get, the more useful is your job. To take two examples, it's like if you make uh, fiscal optimization, you will get a lot of money, uh, which is something about uh, 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 doing, uh, uh, to legalize the way that you don't pay taxes. So it's something illegal, but you legalize it. But on the contrary, you will find women working very early in the morning before you go to work we we'll clean your office or clean the hospital and everything which is very central to make our health system um, uh, workable and uh, they, they get very very low money and it's very precarious thing so for us it was for a lot of reason it was very uh, interesting tool and when uh, uh, there was some campaigns because I think it's really in the beginning of the 2010s and unconditional basic income came back into the political discussion all around Europe, in particular with a campaign, I think in 2013 or 2014, to, um, to sign a petition and to have an official debate um, in EU about it. Uh, we also could see that uh, unconditional basic income, it's a tool uh, which is not enough alone. And a tool is not enough to make a meaningful political project uh, and can be re very easily reappropriated by capitalism and by the system. That's why uh, if you look at the people supporting the idea of basic income, unconditional basic income, you will find libertarians, you will fi find people who are in favor of green growth, who are in favor of neoliberalism or very uh, radical liberalism, and also degrowth people, or people who are really defining the same type of value what degrowth defends, about ecofeminism, about social and environmental justice, about the transition towards sustainability and so on and so on. So we connected unconditional basic income with a lot of other type of uh, economic and social tools, what we started to debate on as well. Another one which is maybe as old as unconditional basic income, it's what we call uh, acceptable maximum income. And we really believe that um, as soon as you speak about 
uh, unconditional basic income, you should systematically connect it with a maximum income. We should um, have a large consensus, it's a human right in our society, that we refuse to abandon anybody uh, toward the misery, but also we reappropriate the sense of the limit, we go out of hubris in our model of society, and uh, we say that you have a, a floor under which we refuse to go, and also a ceiling above it, we refuse to go because uh, uh, it's to go above uh, what's happening now with rising inequalities, minority getting richer and richer and richer. It's something which is not desirable, it's something which is uh, not sustainable from an environmental point of view, because the way of life of the richest is neither sustainable nor generalizable. Uh, we cannot all uh, live like uh, the oligarchs, uh, we cannot all have helicopters and yachts and this type of thing from an environmental point of view. And to achieve that, it means that these people are stealing a part of their environmental footprint to other people and exploiting also a lot of people working for them. So it's unacceptable from a, a social and environmental point of view. Uh, social justice and environmental justice point of view. It's also something which is, I think, very interesting from the logic that we have to kill uh, this uh, uh, myth developed in our capitalistic model of society that to get rich, it's an objective in its own to go to a well-being. All the studies are showing that to increase GDP, to increase uh, uh, how much money you get and everything, is not connected at all with your subjective well-being. And very often, it's even disconnected. Yeah, there are very, very fascinating uh, studies of, about the richest people showing that they are far away from being the most happy people in our model of society. So very often I say that uh, let's implement a maximum income to make the richest people happier. So let's liberate them for, for their problems and so on. So to connect unconditional basic income with maximum income. And also with that idea, how to re-embed the economy, how to relocalize our uh, uh, economies, our production, our exchange, how to implement more um, uh, direct democracy in our territories and everything, how to reappropriate another type of uh, governance on the commons and, and so on. We connected unconditional basic income with alternative local economic system. First with um, uh, local uh, currencies, which should be uh, implemented in a way that with that local currency you can only buy type of things which are produced in a sustainable, transparent, fair way, like uh, uh, with your local currency, you should be able to buy type of locally produced, seasonal, uh, organic food, for example, or local services and so on. Also, to uh, uh, put back in the picture uh, free access to uh, uh, public services and some goods. So to make exactly the contrary to what capitalism is doing, capitalism is about commodifying everything. It started with enclosure in, uh, in UK. So you expel the people from their land and you make profit on that. So we have to make the way uh, back or way to the other direction. So to make for free what we democratically consider as uh, something very important to have a decent life. So to question how to make for free, for example, a certain number of liters of water, what you would use for a good use of this water, like water what you use to cook, to wash yourself, to wash the dishes, to drink and so on should be for free. And it's an opportunity to uh, implement some uh, uh, local democratic, based on direct democracy, deliberation uh, about how much water a family needs and how do we work together to fulfill this basic need for free. And also to rethink a type of pricing where you can overconsume these goods but you have to pay much more for misusage, so that you get for free a certain number of liters of water for good usage, but if you start to use water for your personal swimming pool, or to clean your pickup truck every day, or to uh, water your golf, you will pay a very expensive price for this type of things. So it was a logic of uh, putting together a lot of ideas, uh, as Panos showed about degrowth, it's really a, a matrix of thinking connecting together a lot of uh, uh, theory, a lot of uh, proposals, a lot of deconstruction, a lot of ideologies, a lot of levels as well of uh, implementation of the discussion and, uh, and the proposals and so on. 
and we put everything all together and we end up with the idea of unconditional autonomy allowance. So why autonomy directly refers to uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, who was a Greek but uh, wrote uh, and spent a large part of his life in France and was a very influential philosopher in the French degrowth movement, uh, in particular with that idea of, about um, uh, the institution of your imaginary. So autonomy with unconditional autonomy allowance for us is not only a social or economic tool for more social and environmental justice, but it's maybe first a tool of uh, decolonization of our imaginary, how we can implement discussion, thinking in our society to reappropriate in a meaningful way, in, in, in a democratic way, the question of what are our basic needs and how do we fulfill them in a sustainable, transparent, fair, democratic way. So what do we produce, how, for what kind of usage. So unconditional autonomy allowance is necessarily like what I spoke about before with unconditional basic income, connected to uh, uh, um, implement it with uh, maximum income. And it's like the same logic of unconditional basic income with only one main difference, that a large part of it would be decommodified, wouldn't be given in cash, wouldn't be given in, a, in euro, but it would be given in a local currencies, it would be given in a, uh, accesses to services, so free access to services, and also uh, accesses to uh, uh, certain types of, um, of goods. So services would be, for example, free health for everybody. But if it's to have the same type of health system what we have right now, which is in the hand of, uh, of the pharmaceutical lobby, so we have a way of life which creates a lot of disease, through stress, through uh, um, bad quality, food, through a lot of chemical pollutions, etc., etc., and to have a health system which is still in the hand of profit and pharmaceutical companies, it doesn't make sense. So it's an opportunity to provide free access to health to the people, to re-question what is a healthy way of life, so how to get rid of stress in our society, how to reappropriate uh, healthy food, how to reappropriate healthy way of life, back to um, uh, Hippocrates who says that uh, your medicine will be your, uh, your food and not what we do now, no, only to have palliative approaches towards that. Free access is also to uh, services like public transport in a local way, uh, free access is to uh, um, education for example, uh, to uh, services, what you need to get when somebody next to you dies. I think it's something which should be free and organized by the community to get the services how to uh, uh, implement the funerals for free and so on and not to make business on that and people are making money in a time where you are very weak emotionally and so on. So there are a lot of things what you can put in these free accesses and I would say that it's very important to implement locally dialogue, deliberation, democratic discussion about what is important for you to be free and what is important for you to be out of this logic of capitalism and profit and to be decommodified. Also towards that you could get a lot of uh, uh, goods like food, ideally with local currency, so you implement all around uh, the world a local currency which is connected to a, a local food system which would be seasonal, sustainable, organic, transparent, maybe participatory and so on. Uh, you could get uh, water, you could get a certain number of square meters to have a decent accommodation for free. Also to have what we have today, spaces, uh, what you can reappropriate for meaningful activities, which could be about dancing, it could be about having a coffee, it could be about playing with the children and everything. So how to reappropriate the, the spaces and, uh, and uh, uh, what communist uh, capitalism started to do, so to appropriate the spaces and uh, you need to have a job, to have a space to live and so on. So reappropriation of the commons from this logic is very important. And you can put a lot of things. And again, what's important is the discussion what you implement. You change your approach, you uh, decolonize your imaginary, you re-embed the economy or you exit out of economos economicism. Because uh, to quote Mark Twain, if you have a hammer in your brain, you will uh, see all the problem looking like knives. And the dominant hammer in our brain nowadays is economy. When uh, we see a problem, we will think about how much euros in cost. But it's not about how much euros in cost, it's how do we organize each other in a democratic fair way 
to fulfill the program or to solve the problem and fulfill the basic needs and everything. So this is the last picture about unconditional autonomy allowance connected with uh, maximum income, a type of ID giving from birth to death unconditionally, like a basic income, to everybody based on individual approach, what we democratically consider as enough to have a decent life. And partly it can be given in euros, partly it can be given in local currencies, and also in free accesses to services and goods. How to go there? Because our model of society is quite far away uh, from this uh, logic and this approach. Uh, we see different steps in the implementation of such uh, unconditional autonomy elements. And again, I repeat myself on purpose, that the main goal is maybe not to achieve it from a technical point of view or economic point of view, but what's the most important is to um, decolonize our imaginary in phrasing the problem in a different way and start to think about how to fulfill our basic needs, not based on um, capitalistic approach, but based on how do we self-organize ourselves to uh, provide all the services which are needed to give a decent life to everybody and to reshare, to rethink another type of governance in the commons and everything. So the first step, it's already happening. It's what we do, for example, today. Uh, it's about all the discussion, emerging debates, uh, happening in our society. It's about the consciousness which is rising very, very um, quickly nowadays about uh, the physical limits to growth, about climate change, about biodiversity loss, about uh, overconsuming, about um, a lot of things where people start more and more to understand that our model of, of society, our thermo-industrial civilization, which only rely on always more and economic growth is neither sustainable nor desirable. So you have some cultural dynamics which are very interesting and these cultural dynamics also find a space in experimentation around the collective level of degrowth, around the uh, local initiatives. It's something you can find everywhere all around Europe, all around the world. Uh, there's also very interesting um, dynamics. It's all these local initiatives like local currency, like transition network, like uh, community gardens, like do it yourself. I can give a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of examples about that. And it's very interesting because you can find um, very, very strong dynamics with a lot of creativity, with a lot of enjoyment of life. And I don't say that it's very easy to create your own initiative because you have to fight with the economic system which is which is killing this type of uh, creativity and this type of fair, sustainable, um, uh, transparent, democratic ways to reappropriate and invent new ways to produce, to <coughs> share, to, uh, to consume and so on. Also, it's very interesting to see a lot of uh, converging surveys about behavior change nowadays in our society. And again, all around the world, more and more people uh, are in this dynamic about zero waste, about eat less meat, about stop uh, traveling for no reason to take an airplane every weekend to go to an uh, air condition uh, center in Greece or in Tunisia or in Turkey or wherever and everything. It's far away from being the, uh, the majority, but the dynamics are very interesting to work that. And there are people who don't change their behavior, but start to understand that we have to change our behaviors and, and so on. And what's the most interesting also, there are very interesting indicators about that. Yeah, there are very interesting indicators about that, that more and more people, even if they cannot make a step aside to change their habits, to, ch to quit their bullshit job and to create their own cooperative or to go into solidarity economy, but the interest into it and the will to go out of the system and do something else is very high, in particular among the younger generation. For example, and I will take only one example because time is running, um, in France there was a very interesting petition signed by uh, students in an uh, elite school. We have a very elitist system and we have these uh, grandes écoles, these great schools which are um, uh, elite universities. And uh, among these students, 30,000 of them signed a petition saying that we refuse what is taught in these universities because what is taught in this university is driving our civilization to the world, to the collapse, and we refuse to work for the corporation only in the logic of profit. We want to have meaningful activities. We want to have a life um, which uh, uh, really, really fulfill the basic needs of the people around. And it's coming from the elites in France and so on. So, and I can give you a lot of other examples 
in particular among the younger generation, like the Fridays for Future, which are fantastic movement and very spontaneous movement with high school students blocking large cities all around, all around the world for the future and to change the system and so on. Which year? Yeah, I, I guess, right yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. And uh, so you have the first level that transition is already underway with a lot of contradiction because you also have the, the dominant world with more and more technocracy, bureaucracy, uh, rising inequalities, oligarchic system, police repression. I even don't speak about uh, uh, how France became a very authoritarian uh, uh, country with very violent police repression in the last months and so on. But you have this dynamic on which we can start to construct the transformation of the society and from a grassrooted approach in developing always more and more in a decentralized way, cooperatives, behavior change and so on, we can have a radical transformation of our model of society and step by step implement unconditional autonomy elements. But as Panos said, Digos is not only about grassroots movement, it's to connect it with different type of transformation. And we think that we need to have resistance um, to block what's happening with the dominant system, in particular nowadays, there is a huge amount of money put in the system to uh, invest in a lot of useless large-scale infrastructure projects, um, to invest in, uh, for example, shell, um, shell, uh, shell oil, shell gas, to look for more energy, to look for more resources and this type of thing. So we have to, to fight and resist against this uh, growth paradigm, against this always more profit, against this quantitative easing, against rising inequalities, against fiscal evasion, and so on and so on. So you need to have resistance, and you also need, connected to that, to have a political agenda. And the first step which I think could work, and uh, where we could find a very large consensus all around Europe, would be the idea to work less, to give a chance for everybody to have a, to have a job. Because in a society dominated by the centrality of work, it's very violent if you are unemployed. You are excluded from the society and everything. So it could be a step toward, toward um, the implementation of unconditional basic income. And in doing so, you will liberate some free time to a lot of people who have to, uh, to accept bullshit job but they are not happy with. And with that free time, they could be involved more and more in, um, in care, in uh, reading books, in in uh, talking to each other, in uh, implementing community gardens, in being active in the transformation of this solidarity economy and going out of, uh, of the centrality of economy, what we are dying on. The next step will be the implementation of unconditional basic income. As you say, that uh, it's much more effective and easy to uh, implement than the type of welfare state that we are right now, which is ineffective and very bureaucratic. So it's to give for everybody the right, like we can do it on different levels, and there are already municipalities or even a district in the city of Budapest implementing. So you can really start low scale or larger scale. So let's say that the, let's do it globally on the EU level. That we say on EU, every EU citizen has a basic income, which is enough in euro to have a decent life. So you can implement it, but it has to be embedded into a political agenda. So back to the dynamics what we have in our society, so it should go through cultural changes and behavior changes and the implementation of alternatives on the local level and um, also a network of these alternatives with dialogue and what we call open relocalization that we have to relocalize but we have to stay connected to create solidarities and dialogue and also uh, to learn from each other and so on. Uh, for example, I think if you implement such an unconditional basic income you should implement parallelly to that, of course, the maximum income, but it says that we start from 1 to 100 maximum income and we give 10 years to go to 1 to 4, that uh, uh, all around the society you have a, a ratio from 1 to 4 from the minimum income and the maximum income. And uh, also you have to, re to regulate things like advertisement, because I think to implement an unconditional basic income in a society uh, well, advertisement is so much dominant, you will create type of contradictory uh, uh, situation. It's what's happened in France, for example, when um, the socialist implemented the 35 hours per week. Uh, the next candidate for the, the presidential election was, who was elected was work more to earn more. So somehow there was some conflict that on one hand we explained to the people that you're going to work less, you will be happier, but you will have less money, but you will be happier. And on the other hand, people went home, watched TV, 
and they got this narrative that to be happy you need to buy a bigger car, you need to buy a bigger, a bigger screen and everything. So there was some uh, cognitive dissonance um, uh, in, in this perspective. So yeah, how to uh, regulate uh, this advertisement and everything. And doing so, you can also rethink how to re-embed the economy in reappropriating uh, uh, the finance system. So to question what is public debt, I think it's a very tough question in a country like Greece because you suffered so much from this big lie and this big myth constructed about public debt and the type of uh, economic regulation you have to implement to reimburse the debt which will never be reimbursed. To rethink what is money creation, what's the role of a central bank, to uh, uh, control the bank system and finance and so on. And step by step, starting from uh, this unconditional basic income, you can demonetize in a, dis in a decentralized way, um, in a, in a relocalized way, uh, this basic income toward unconditional autonomy allowance. And I conclude, I won't be too long, last sentences. You start, for example, in a city like Thessaloniki and you have a basic income which is like six or 700 euros for every citizen of Thessaloniki and you already implemented uh, a system with the water which is public, transparent, managed by the local citizens and you get for free the first liters of water what you need to have a, a, a meaningful usage of it. So you don't get any more with 700 but you get 600 plus free water. You implement also with a network of community gardens and local food production around the city which is organic, seasonal, sustainable and, and so on, a type of food system with a local currency where everybody can get the food with that local currency from a local point of view. So you don't get any more with 600 plus water but you get the local currency, 400 euros and the free water. And it's a way to re-embed the economy or it's a way to go out of economicism and to have a different type of uh, things in putting in the center free accesses, reciprocity economy, local economic system, and also to let some space for the market and to have good balance between all of them. So thank you very much for your attention.